Good morning, I'll just start again. Good morning, everyone. My name is Merle Massey. I am the um, coordinator for undergraduate research here at the University of Saskatchewan. And I am presenting today on how to make a research poster. This is for the um, student undergraduate research experience program here at the University of Saskatchewan, where it's undergraduate students who are conducting summer research projects. This is a bit of a, a unconventional upside down approach to how to make a research poster. And uh, let's get started. See if we can actually make it go. As we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory on the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. So my first question is, have you ever created a poster? A research poster. Have any of you ever worked on a research poster before? And you can pop that into the chat. Matish, nope. Yeah, the Sve has, yes. So it's a bit of a mix by the looks of things. Kind of. That's an interesting question. <laughs> Kind of, but no, kind of, but no. Uh, some of you may have had to do one for a class, depending on what year you're in. But a research poster is um, a specific way that we use. It's a visual way that we use to show our research. So it's not like a hand poster, like what this kid is in the picture. It's definitely a little bit more upscale than that. But the creativity that you need and the abandon that you need uh, to 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 be a kid and create something fun, don't lose that. You will need a little bit of that creativity to make the very best poster that you can. Things to think about after today. What I want you to think about today is your audience. Number one, your audience is the number one thing whenever we write or create anything. It's not about us, it's about our audience. The one big thing, what that is, is the one big thing that you want people to know about your research. The one thing you hope that they remember six months from now, two years from now. Say it in plain language. Academics are particularly bad at this, uh, including myself. I am trained as an academic as well. But to say something in plain language means that you say it once and people understand what you've just said the first time. That's plain language, and that's what you're aiming for. Sketch and plan. So the time that you take to plan your poster and sketch it out and put your thought into it will go a long ways to making your poster that much better. Good visuals. So as you're building your research, think about your visuals. Any way that you can show what you've done visually as opposed to just writing it out is a good plan, but making good visuals is important. Course designing and building, there's some technical background stuff to think about. And then finally, presenting, presenting what you've done. So that's what we're going to talk about today, all of these things. And I'll try and do it as quickly as we can. So here's the first thing, which is more important, how smart you sound or how much your audience understands? And it's not a trick question, as difficult as it is. Which one do you think? Go ahead and put it in the chat. The later one, how much your audience understands. Absolutely, how much your audience understands, which is different actually than say if you're doing this for a class, because if you're doing this for a class, of course you want to sound as smart as you can. However, that's the secret. The easier you make it for your audience to understand what you're presenting, the more smart they're going to think you are. So, Aim for how much your audience understands, and they're automatically going to think, wow, that person is really amazing and really smart. What is a research poster? So this picture was taken last year. We had we were able to have a live session. We hosted it at Convocation. So this are these are the summer students who had summer research positions last summer. Uh, and they were able to make physical posters and put them up at Convocation Hall, and uh, we hosted a live event last August. How many of you went? How many of you were there? Did anyone have a chance to go? Have any of you been to a research poster session? Natish was there. Absolutely. 
Alex has been. Yeah. And then there's yeah, yes, but not to that one. And that happens. Yes. Yeah, so the USSU also had the symposium in uh, in uh, January of this past year. And uh, so there was a poster session there. Lots of the colleges actually have poster sessions as well. So that's very important. And it happens uh, quite a lot. So it happens quite often on campus, uh, particularly for undergraduate students. So it, any opportunity that, that you might have to do this, of course, is, is great. This summer, we won't be able to do it live. None of the buildings on campus are still uh, are, are they're still closed, they're not yet open. And so we don't have access to Convocation Hall to do it live. So we are in my office, we're busy working on how we're going to host a virtual poster session. We will do it both asynchronously and synchronously uh, between the 24th and 26th of August, pardon me, of this summer. And uh, so there'll be a chance for everyone to go in, look at everyone else's posters, leave comments, ask questions, and then we'll have a live portion as well. So that's our tentative plan. More information will come as we get a little closer. But that's what a research poster session looks like. So here's what a research poster is. It's visual. It's very visual. It's really, really important to think about this as kind of a snapshot or, or um, a, yeah, a visual presentation of what you're doing. It's almost like an advertisement. This is what we did. This is what the research was about. This is what I want you to remember. It's short. It's way shorter than what you think it is. There is no way that you can put your entire summer of research information onto a poster. It's absolutely not possible. It is your one big thing. And that's something I really want you to think about. If people only remember one thing about your poster, what is that one big thing that you want them to remember? And we'll talk about that in a minute. It is also a help for you to explain your story. It's not very often that a poster will be left on its own to just kind of do its own thing. Uh, you know, you will sometimes see them walking up and down the university in the hallways outside of a faculty member's office. Uh, you will sometimes see it that way, but usually it's a visual and you're also part of it there to explain it. It's a, it's a, it's a cue for your interactive. So the other, the last thing is that a poster is an analytical tool. It's just like what you call writing up your research. This is a, a way for you to, to think about what you've done, why you did it the way you did it, and to explain it to someone else who knows nothing about your research. So the process of creating a poster is in itself an analytical tool. And I've had student after student and faculty member after faculty member, good researchers who tell me that I didn't really understand what I did until I put together a poster. Then I really had to put it all together and understand it. You write it first for yourself and then you explain it to someone else. This is what it's not. It is not a whole essay just put on a big piece of paper. I don't know how many of you have been to poster sessions where the printing on the poster was so small that they literally tried to do that. They tried to put a whole paper just onto a large poster and tack it up on the wall. It's impossible to read. You're, you're exhausted before you even start. So it is not a whole essay. It's also not a bunch of small graphics that nobody can see or understand. If you put any visuals on, you need to be quite cautious and careful over what you put on there and to make sure that it's large enough to see and that it makes sense. It's not just your results. This is something that people really need to remember. It's about your original research question, your process, any deviations or hiccups that you had along the way, your methods, and your results. So, it, so yes, it's your one big thing, but people want to know how you got there, especially if they're going to take the time to interact with you and have a conversation about your poster. They want to know how you arrived where you arrived. And last, it is never written up at the end of the project. People who come from the sciences in particular will tell me this. Oh, I'm just going to take the last six weeks of my of my project, my uh, um, capstone or my honors course, and I'll just write it up at the end. Well, guess what? If it's part of a project, you need to be writing the whole way along, whether you're writing your research journal and keeping notes every day of what you did and the choices that you made along the way, or if you stop and you've already done a literature review, that's a an important piece of the writing process. So 
a good research process incorporates writing along the whole way of the process. So do keep that in mind. So you get good with practice. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be able to, I think what I'm going to do is, uh, so this, this link to this uh, YouTube video, simply because I'm having trouble uh, figuring out how to share a different screen. Um, what I'm going to do is just send you guys the links to this, but it's a, it's a wonderful session on um, how someone who's done a m series of posters over the course of his career as an undergraduate student, he shows his very first poster that he made and all the things that were good and all the things that were wrong with it. And then the next poster that he made and the next poster that he made. So I'll send you guys the links in an email uh, for this, but it's a fantastic video to show that not everybody gets it right the first time. And sometimes you have to take a look at what you've done and what you've learned from the first poster that you've done and use that to inform what you do going forward. It's a great learning video. So I'll send you guys the link. One of the things, the most important thing when you're writing is that there's what do you want to say? And then there's what does the audience want to know? And these are not necessarily the same thing. Which of the two do you guys think is more important? On a poster, what should you concentrate on? What you want to say or what does the audience want to know? And go ahead and put that in the chat. Yeah, absolutely. What the audience wants to know. That is absolutely. So what you want to say and what you think is the most important aspect of your research might be might be a really good idea and you want to keep that in mind. But for the most part, you have to think about what does your audience want to know. So there's the next question. For an academic poster that talks about your research, who's your audience? And you can even think about this in terms of if you're planning on coming to the summer symposium, the online symposium, or if you're putting your poster into a, uh, another um, conference, who's your audience at a conference like that? And again, go ahead and tuck that into the chat. Who's your audience for an academic research poster? Other students, professors, absolutely. And when you say professors, so usually supervisors and anyone else from a lab or a research group, they always come uh, to the poster sessions, but absolutely other students. One of the best things about our poster sessions that we do at the, the summer symposium poster sessions is that the other students want to know what you've done and how you spent your summer. Yeah, those from other research areas. Thanks, Jenny. Absolutely. Because, of course, the, the point of a conference like this is not just to stay within your own confines of your own research group, but also to see what other people across the campus are doing and to learn about what they're doing. So that's your audience. It is undergraduate students, supervisors, all the way up to scientists. That's right. It's, a, it's an amazing resource. It's an amazing place to kind of capture what's happening at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, I will be sending out an invitation to all of the uh, upper administration in, at campus for them to drop in as well and to take a look at the posters and to uh, 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 leave their thoughts. So hopefully some of them will be able to drop in as well. So that's your audience, obviously, yes. Undergraduate students, supervisors, scientists, people from other research areas. So that's what we were just doing was to discuss who our audience is. So thanks for that. Here's an interesting one. Why are you doing this work? What is your larger goal? What is the purpose of your work? For some of you, it's pretty simple. It's like my purpose of my work was that he, my supervisor, she offered me a summer position and, and that's okay. But sometimes what you're doing is that you might, what you're doing over the course of the summer contributes to your larger research purpose. Maybe your, maybe the purpose of what you're doing, for example, for me, when I was doing my PhD, my purpose of my work, my larger goal was to upend the idea of Saskatchewan as nothing but prairie. My PhD research 
uh, in three words was Saskatchewan has trees. And, <laughs> and what it was, was a, a very, very, uh, it was actually an award winning work that talked about the northern half of Saskatchewan and particularly the transition zone between the prairies and the north and how the two work together. Now, this has nothing to do with anything other than to remember that the purpose of your work is that larger goal. A lot of my work now as a historian is that I think about why people tell stories the way they do. I always think about what's their reason behind the way that they have chosen their story, why they're telling it with a particular lens and a particular focus. That's what I do. And that's the, the uh, larger purpose of your work for you. Let's say my friend Andrea, she is very interested in animal ecology and she's working on squirrels and how they cache, how they uh, keep their food safe. And so that's a really fascinating way um, to think about animal behavior. And so her, her larger interest, the purpose of her work is to discover more about animal behavior. So that's what I want you guys to think about. What is the larger purpose of your work? What is the larger goal? And it doesn't necessarily have to be yours, but maybe this is something that you can ask your supervisor. What's the larger goal in this work? Are we trying to find a cure for cancer? Are we trying to make sure that uh, uh, people can survive COVID? Whatever it is that you're working on. All right, then when you think about your research, and you're sitting down to create your poster. What is the one big thing that you want people to know? What's the one thing that you want people to remember of what you did of your work? Oftentimes your one big thing can be split into four major possibilities. One is theory. For some of us, we work in the realm of theory. I don't, I'm allergic to theory, but some people do, and some people are very good at it. And so the one big thing that they want to know is that you've built or created some aspect or you've furthered an aspect of theory. Another area is methods, particularly in the sciences. You might be at a research lab that's pioneering a new method. You might even be lucky enough to work in a research lab that actually built a new um instrument of some kind. And so it might be that the methodology that you've that you've been working on is actually the one big thing that you want people to remember. Others might, most of us end up in the third box, which is results. A lot of us end up talking about the results of what we've done. This is what we've discovered. This is a piece of knowledge that did not exist before my work came into being. And so you're presenting the world with a piece of information, some results. The last box is intervention, and this one is a bit of the unicorn in the room. This is this is sort of the everybody needs to eat 10 goji berries every day and they will never get cancer. That is what now I'm not saying that that's true, but that is an example of an intervention. This is something that we know from our research that everyone in the world needs to know and everyone needs to stop the one thing that they're doing and start doing something else. For example, the wearing of masks. We now know that if people wear even non-medical masks during COVID-19, that we will reduce our level of transmission by a factor of, of uh, quite, a, uh, I forget the number, pardon me, but by a high factor. So the exa an, an, an example of an intervention is the wearing of non-medical masks when you're out in public during COVID-19. So that would be an example of an intervention. So these are sort of the four main areas, theory, methods, results, and intervention. Your one big thing, whatever it is that came out of your research might fit into one of these four boxes, most likely results, but it could be anywhere within this. The next area that I wanted to talk about is plain language. You'll see where it says eschew obfuscation. Uh, does anyone know what that means? Eschew obfuscation. My English teacher, when I was in grade 10, had that in massive letters that went all the way around the room. And it was one of the first things, avoid being confusing, absolutely deliberately confusing. So do not be deliberately confusing. And it's, of course, that's what makes that saying so silly because they're using a very, very obfuscating way, a confusing way of saying, don't be confusing. Exactly. So plain language, plain language is stronger not weaker than academic language. It will make your academic writing better. I don't know how many of you 
have more than one language or are able to work in more than one language. But what you'll find is that the papers that are that are um, shared and referenced the most, and it doesn't matter if it's in the sciences, if it's an article in Nature or Science, or if it's an article in any kind of association journal, any article that gets shared a couple hundred times, a couple thousand times, and is referenced and has that high R factor, what you'll find is that those papers, those journal articles were written in a very plain language. And what that means is that you could understand what it said and you understood what they meant the first time you read it. How many of you, like me, read an academic journal article and you had to go back and read the same paragraph four or five or 10 times, and you're still not 100% sure that you understand what it said. Uh, ha, ha, exactly. That happens all the time. Uh, it happened, yeah, it, it happens to all of us and it happens all the time. So you can tell that's an automatic clue that they're not writing in plain language. So, oh good, Jack, Jack's smarter than us. He says that only happens from time to time. That's awesome. And that is a, either that or you're really reading really good articles, which is great. But plain language makes your academic writing stronger. People will understand what you say when you say it. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. That's a classic Albert Einstein quote. And of course, he's held up as being one of the smartest men that we've ever, um, and smart and accomplished men who've ever come up through the planet uh, as a scientist. But the point that he's making is that the more you understand something, the easier it will be for you to explain it to someone else. So that's critical. If I can give you any piece of advice, is to start writing as soon as you start your research. And also, particularly in the context of creating your um, poster, it takes longer to make a clear and short and excellent poster. So give yourself time. If you haven't already started your poster, please do so now, um, after the presentation, obviously. But today, start working on it. This is about editing, editing, and editing, getting it down, and then proofreading. Uh, one of the best ways to proofread is to read it out loud. Um, also ask other people to read it. Most of you, your supervisor, will want to have a good look at your poster. I know that I had a student last summer who went through 12 iterations of her poster before her and her supervisor were finished with it. So do expect that it will take a long time. It takes longer to write it. All right. Now we're going to take a look at some poster designs. These are ones that I've pulled off the internet. Uh, this is an actual poster that someone put together. I don't know if you can see it, but it was a, it's a it's a cut and paste job. Um, and if necessary, it absolutely can be done that way. It's not ideal and there are better technologies available. And so we'll talk about some of those today. But we're going to take a look at just poster design. Uh, you might not want to crank, um, crank up your visuals because some of these you're not going to be able to see. And that is honestly as big as I can make it. What I want you to do is put in the chat what you like and don't like about each of these posters. This is the first one using a windbreak. Anything that you like about it, anything that you don't like about it. This one is not that visually appealing, I agree. I'm sure that the content is, I like that the passages are numbered. Not enough visuals to go with the words. These are all great concepts. Um, I do like what you said and I love the pictures, charts, diagrams, too wordy and too small. Absolutely, it is too wordy, it is too small. When you have to number your boxes, that means that your visual design um, is, a, is a bit problematic. If you have to put numbers in to tell people where to go next, um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, but yeah, it's all just a little bit too small. Don't like the overall layout. Definitely could do something more with the poster. So we are going to go to the second poster for you guys to take a look at. What do you like? 
What do you not like? Flow is easier to understand. It's more precise. It's a bit plain and boring. It's easier to read. That's true. Could be more description of the bar graphs. It's one of those funny things that people think that a visual is easier to read or understand, but not everybody understands what a bar graph is. They won't necessarily know what they're looking at. There could be more description. The layout looks similar to the paper it may have been based off of. Absolutely. You do get a little bit of, you know, the objective materials and methods, results, conclusions, at least some of that is there. And sometimes I'm just not interested in reading it, to be honest. I think that that's fair. I think it's still maybe less words. Yeah, it could be. So let's take a look at another one. I've got quite a few to look at. All right, tell me what you like and what you don't like about this one. This one usually draws some uh, pretty interesting commentary. I hate the background. Well, there you go. Is it not visually appealing or does it? Yeah, it's hard to read. It makes it hard to read. The background is interesting, but it's yeah, too much water. Absolutely. So the, the clearly you get to know that you're talking about water and fish. So that that gives you a visual cue right there. However, it's too much. Um, yeah, change fonts. Yeah, there's some interesting. Yeah, the graphs are too small. I'm going to drown. It's too bold. <laughs> Natish, that's very funny. It's a, uh, it gives you a very uh, good example of what not to do in terms of the background. So definitely keep that in mind. Sometimes a background is really helpful, but in this case, it's taking away from the overall thread of the poster. How about this one? I don't know if any of you are old enough to remember the Muppets, but I always think of the Muppets on this one. Too many words. Yeah. The layout is confusing. Too much jazz. It is very jazzy. <laughs> so, yeah, you certainly get the idea that you're in space. Absolutely. It reminds me of the uh, Muppet sketch pigs in space yeah or anybody who watches star wars obviously the uh no visual main point you get tired before you read it so there's a there's definitely some problems going on between the white font and the dark background and and the amount of text it's difficult to read it might be a little bit the background color scheme yeah absolutely so the black hole in space had they done something a little bit different on the the colors, at least they've got boxes, which is different than this one, um, where the black is just against that really, really crazy background. But this one, so they've got boxes, which is definitely better, but you can still see um, a bit of the space behind it, which makes it quite hard. My eyes are crossing with the word background color screen. Uh, maybe not so young eyes. Yeah, absolutely. I don't have young eyes either. So it's definitely a problem. There's, there's, some, there's some wild things going on in this one. Uh, you definitely get the idea of where they're going, black holes in space and so on and so forth, but it's, it, and it's appealing, but it's difficult to read. How about this one? It's very hard to read. The yellow against the yellow um, is quite problematic. And so there's just not enough con. Yeah, poor choice of colors. Uh, less vibrant. The, the background is lovely. It's very vibrant. It's eye catching if you're across the room. But even if you get up close, you actually still are having trouble reading it. So it's definitely um, it's stressful and the images uh, need to be a little bit different. There are some good things going on like on the left hand side, the big box. That's fantastic. But over on the right hand side, those visuals are far too small. So definitely some interesting um, things to, to maybe consider and maybe to not consider. How about this one? 
This actually comes from the University of Saskatchewan from College of Education and College of Medicine. The graphics are cool. I'm not sure that I really understand what they mean. Resistance free distributed leaders. Someone might think that they actually were doing a research project with balls and and uh, balancing them, uh, but the graphics are very cool and they do display the overall thought of resistance um, free leadership. The poster is visually very appealing. You can move from one box to the other. I really like the overall quality and idea. Well organized, great picks. Their chart results could be bigger. Yes, definitely a good point. The, the results chart is pretty small and difficult to read. But overall, uh, I think this, this is probably, I would consider it to be definitely one of the, a better example of a poster. Now, one of the things that, that I normally do is that I break uh, at this point and I allow people to see there's something called Poster 2.0 by a guy named Matt Morrison. And we usually watch a few minutes of video there and, and uh, you'll see that the link is there on the bottom. What Matt did, and I'll just kind of give you a the 30 second overview is that he developed what he calls Poster 2.0. And this is a classic example in front of you. This came from the poster session here at the University of Saskatchewan last summer. So this is an undergraduate student uh, who, who conducted the research and created this poster. The purpose of poster 2.0 and the reason why I'm interested in allowing you guys to think about it is that in the center front and center with a color is his one is the one big idea. The one thing that the person who made this poster wanted you to remember from that poster and then on the sides is still the introduction, the methods, the results, any of the graphs and so on and so forth. So it's one of those things where if you were walking by at a poster session and there were 50 posters kind of like this you could without too much work figure out what each poster was about and from that be able to go in and then start to ask questions and have that deeper discussion with the person who created the poster but if you only had a half an hour to run through the poster session at that con at that conference or that uh, symposium and kind of get a sense of what everybody at the poster session what had been studying, this gives you a really good opportunity to just get that very quick snapshot of what they had actually done. So this is an example of what's called Poster 2.0, and there's a link here for YouTube, and I will send you guys all the link as well. There's a few more poster examples uh, from last summer that I wanna continue showing you. So here's a modified version. Again, you'll see in the center, he put his one big thought and then a, a few smaller examples of things that you should think about. And then he talked about his introduction, his methodology, his discussion, so on and so forth. And I like having the main point in the center. It, and if you're interested, then you go ahead and read the description. That's exactly the point of posters like this. So this is another example of a student who last summer used the two, poster 2.0 template and then made some changes to it. This is another example. This is Hope Fulton, if anyone knows her. Uh, Hope did a sort of a, a modified version. Um, and this is something that she worked with with her supervisor that her main point is front and center. You can read it right away, but her supervisor still wanted to kind of have more of a classic uh, poster look. And so they, they compromised and this is what they came up with. And, and Hope was actually one of the poster winners last summer. So this worked out really, really well for her and to have that there. And here's another one that uh, used a, a modification of the poster 2.0 design where, where but instead of that blank um, color, the flat color, she used a, a photograph, which is amazing. So one of the other things about a poster 2.0, and you can see it very clearly in this poster, is that there's a QR code that's embedded right on the poster. So if people don't have time to read the whole poster, they take a picture of the QR code where your entire poster is there. And sometimes people will use that QR code uh, and and it will provide a link to a website or um, further investigation. So that's something that's that's often done on modern post on posters in the last couple of years. You'll see a QR code on them. So these are some examples uh, from the from undergraduate students 
here at the U of S and what they did for the poster session last year. So I wanted to show you a few of those so that you had a chance to uh, take a look at, at what we've done here. Next, okay, big deep breath, plan it out. One of the big things, this is just a poster wall with a whole bunch of post-it notes on it, but I recommend post-it notes for you to plan out what you're going to do on your poster. Take a big piece of paper and it can be actually, if you've got small enough post-it notes, you can do it just with an eight and a half by 11, but you can think about what are the main themes that you want to put in your poster and make sure that one of those post-it notes also has your one big thing, the one thing that you want everyone to remember from your research. So plan it out using, I've also hand sketched posters and, uh, and come up with uh, where I wanted to go that way, but also always start with a sketch, then you can move on. Once you kind of have your sketch in mind, and here's the thing, and I'm gonna go back, here's the thing about planning it out. When you plan it out, you're going to find that you've got less room than what you think you have. So you need to be really focused on what you're going to concentrate on. There is no way, and I've said this before, but I'll say it again, there is no way that you can put your entire summer of research onto one poster. You need to think about which slice of your research, which particular aspect of what you've done that you want to share on your poster. That's really critical because you have less room on your poster than you think you do. And so the sooner you recognize that and take and concentrate on one slice, the easier your poster is going to be. Now, we're going to move into talking about good visual design. This is also critical to a poster. If you think that you're going to make a poster that's all text, no one's going to want to read it. So graphics, charts, figures, images, consistency, and text. So take a look at the before. What do you see uh, on the screen in terms of the graphics? Of course, it says it for itself, lack of consistency. Various fonts used, various style shapes, you can see that this is a little bit in this. Um, I've, I've been just as guilty of this as someone as anyone else. I'm in a rush. I leave it to the last minute. I do the best I can with the time that I have and it ends up looking a little bit like a mess. But if you can take a little bit more time, use a program to create to help you create your graphics, you're going to end up with something much more clean, much more visual, visually appealing and something that you can use both on a poster and also think your way through whatever visuals you might want to put into a published uh, paper. All of you are working for faculty members. They are always thinking about publications. So if you are going to take the time to create something visual out of your research, make sure that you're doing a good job. These are examples of different kinds of graphics and I, and the idea is to use graphics, diagrams, charts instead of text wherever possible. But here's one thing to keep in mind. Not all of your audience can read those things right off the hop. So it's important to make sure that even if you choose to use a graphic instead or a diagram or a pie chart or a scatter plot instead of text, you still need to be able to explain it. So make sure that you're using the most clear graphics that you can from your research, making them visually very, very appealing. Try not to use um, things that are a little bit more um, detailed and complex. Think about your audience and how much they already know and if they're going to be able to read and understand your visuals. That's very critical. For me, Scatter plots, splines, radars, uh, not so good. Pie charts, yeah, I'm fine. We see lots of pie, char pie charts and vertical bars in the newspaper. I'm a historian by profession. Those ones I can understand a little bit more and, and line charts. Scatter plots, not 100% sure. Usually I need to be uh, coached through them just a little bit more. So there is, there is a little bit of a hierarchy as well in terms of what people are able to understand. So do keep that in mind. Visuals are always good. Make sure, though, that you say where you got it from. 
every time you use a visual, and you'll notice that most of the visuals that I use are in the uh, public domain, you always want to make sure that you say who, if it's a photograph, you actually have to say nowadays who the photographer was, if you know. You can say photographer unknown, especially if it's something that you're uh, pulling from a public uh, domain, such as a library or an archive. Uh, but you still need to cite where it came from. And uh, you'll notice on the bottom that I cite the, pho the photograph number that this was given to. And this is a picture of Big Bear. He's in the center uh, with the, the st uh, striped and the wonderful hat. That's Big Bear. So this is at, trading at Fort Pitt in 1884. If you're going to use a chart or a graph that you've pulled from the internet, make sure that it is in the public domain. Make sure that you are allowed to use it. And if you are, that is perfectly fine, but you still have to showcase where you got it from. So this comes from NASA. This is a global temperature anomalies chart, it comes from NASA. So anytime that you pull something off the internet, that is fine, but you do need to make sure that it is um, uh, in the Creative Commons, that it's in the public domain. How to cite research, how to cite for research related images, example, fluorescent images. That's uh, a difficult one. Again, make sure that it's either in the public domain or the other question that some of you may need to address is that some of you may have images uh, that are coming out of your summer of research that you need to check with your supervisor and make sure that they will allow you to put that image on your poster because your poster is considered to a certain extent a publication. Now, the way that we've chosen to do our poster symposium this year is since it won't be physical, we are going to do it within Canvas because we want to make sure that if anyone has uh, intellectual property from the lab that has not yet been published uh, in the wider world, we want to make sure that it is protected. And so we're going to do everything on Canvas to make sure that any of you that has intellectual property that's not yet been published from your lab that it's not going to be out into, into onto the internet, into the public domain. So how do we cite research related images, for example, fluorescent images? Again, make sure that you can cite them, that they're in the public domain. And usually the, the picture or the website will tell you whether or not something is in the public domain. Sometimes you have to send an email and ask permission to use a particular image. And that's fine too. Most people will give you permission, but do take the time to ask. Aside from visuals, there will still be some text on your poster. There are some general rules around text sizes, depending on how big your poster is. Our posters this year, because they're going to be viewed on the internet, uh, it still matters. You still want your poster to be as visually appealing and as easy to read as possible. So make sure that the body text is no smaller than 24 points. That may sound really large to you, uh, but trust me, if you're taking a look at a whole poster, the fewer words you have on it and the larger font you can make it, the better. It just means edit, 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 cut, cut, cut. Any word that doesn't need to be there, take it out. So these are some general guidelines. Again, this is pretty specific. You aren't bound specifically by these guidelines, but they're a good general rule. Font, that's something that people don't often think about, but font actually does matter. It, if you're giving a live presentation or on the internet, sans serif fonts are actually quite good. So Calibri, Arial, Lucida, these are the classic ones that you will see. A serif font, that means, that means that it has that little bit of a curly cue on the end of the uh, each letter. Uh, a serif font, they're easier to read in print. So if you're going to be printing this poster and it's going to be, say, up on the wall outside your supervisor's office, you might consider a serif font rather than a sans serif font. So do think about the font that you're going to use, and that really depends on if it's going to be viewed on the internet or if it's going to be viewed in print. The process of writing your poster, figuring out what you want to say, and then editing and editing it down is part of your analysis, particularly if you're sharing your poster with other people as you're going along and saying, okay, here's my first go, what are your questions? Ask 
other people in your lab, whether it's master students, PhD students, postdocs, or even some of your other friends, or I can connect you with other people through Sure. It's a good idea to have a buddy system uh, so that you can work on your posters together, even if you're in completely different fields. In fact, that makes it better because if you've got a buddy who's looking at your poster and they're from outside your field, they're going to ask the questions that it doesn't even occur to you to ask. And they may seem quite simple, but it will help you through your analysis and it will help you in your presentation. It will help you to under, the better you understand it yourself, the better you'll be able to explain it to someone else. So the sooner you get going on your poster, the better your poster will be. Okay, building the poster. Now, every one of you is responding, you're in, dis you're in different disciplines, you have different supervisors, you have uh, different backgrounds and you're at different stages in your research. Some of you are just doing pure literature searches this summer. It's a little tougher to do a poster when it's just a literature search. Others of you are physically in the lab or out in the field, so you're going to have different things going on your poster. These are some of the technical aspects to, to building your poster. Most of you, I'd say probably 90 to 95% of you will use Microsoft PowerPoint. It's the most common, it's the easiest, most of you already know how to use it and learn and use it. Some of you might be using some of the Adobe, uh, Corel Draw, a few will use that just depending. However, YouTube is your friend. I am just giving a quick overview of, of things to think about when you're putting together your poster, but the actual technical aspects of putting together a poster, let's say in Microsoft PowerPoint, go search on YouTube and you'll be able to find some great two, three, five minute uh, videos on how to put together a, a poster using PowerPoint. The next thing that you'll have is that most of you need to use the communications templates that come out from the University of Saskatchewan. The link is there. There are other uh, poster presentations. These are um, almost all, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of these are templates that have been created with uh, PowerPoint. The University of Saskatchewan has their own. There's a three or four different options uh, going through those templates. And so you can have your poster either uh, landscape or portrait, and you can do either way. That doesn't matter. And uh, there's some background graphics that are included in some of those poster templates that your supervisor will probably want you to use uh, since we are all at the University of Saskatchewan. So definitely take a look at the template, use any template that's out there, but you might want to take a look at some of these other templates just to give yourself some ideas because you can't, you, you're not bound by the templates that are created and presented by the University of Saskatchewan. They do give you a starting point and if you're pressed for time, they're quite plug and play. So definitely a good idea. However, Google is your friend. If you find research poster templates from somewhere else that you'd like to use and you just want to swap in some of the graphics from the University of Saskatchewan logos or uh, your department or college logos, that is certainly an option as well. Here's a classic uh, one online where you can add uh, build your poster and again when i say plug and play i really mean plug and play it'll tell you introduction it'll tell you methodology and it'll have everything laid out for you so some of them are quite easy white space don't be afraid of white space it helps your poster to breathe it helps your poster to sing it gives your readers and your audience a visual cue that if you have words on that poster, those words are very important. If you fill the whole poster with words, people won't read it. White space will make your poster more readable, more enjoyable, and easier on people's eyes and minds. So do make sure that you recognize that white space helps your poster to breathe. Actually, here's, here's what you need to think about. It's the 40-40-20 rule. It's 40% text, 40% white space, and 20% visuals. Sorry, 20% text, 40% figures, 40% white space. I almost got that. No more than 300 words on the whole poster. Think back on some of those crazy posters that we took a look at. Make sure that you have a very simple, very consistent color scheme. 
<laughs> like visual elevator pitch and speech. Absolutely. That is exactly what this is. No more than 300 words on the whole poster and actually 250 is better. No background pictures, gradients behind the text. Remember that one with that someone felt that they were drowning? Yeah. So try not to do that. If you're going to use background pictures or gradients, make sure that it's very, very uh, well done and uh, in the background. Use your highest resolution, graphs, images, figures, pictures only. Your information should flow left to right and top to bottom. And simple words are the most powerful. Do not use a complex word when a simple word will do just as well. My favorite example, don't use the word utilize when use is just as good. Keep that in mind. Yeah, no more than 300 words. So if you can get it down to 300 words before you start crafting your poster, you're doing very well. We do have drop-in help, no appointment necessary. Uh, contact leave market at, at USASC. So um, these, because we're all online now, you can send an email to leave or to writing help, and they can take a look at what you've got, your 300 words, and help you with some feedback. So, pardon me, and the tutors are from a range of disciplines. So don't worry if you're, uh, uh, what your background or discipline is, the Writing Center is there to help you make it as clear and clean as you can. There's a really great and a very, I have a question. Sometimes the research work doesn't go the way it's supposed to and doesn't give you results. It's hard to determine your one big thing. As research can't be perfect always, what do you suggest for situations like this where you take a good amount of time on an experiment, but it doesn't give you results? Thanks. That is a really good question, particularly at the undergraduate level. We actually had two students that had posters at the symposium last summer who did exactly that. They talked about how their research didn't work and uh, where things went wrong. And it was actually quite fascinating because their non-result actually showed almost what not to do or things were supposed to happen a particular way and they didn't. Especially here at the undergraduate level, uh, not only is that expected, it's actually to be celebrated. Because you're right, your research can't always be perfect and you won't get results that are um, maybe that you can replicate, which of course is very necessary in science. You can't actually run the experiment again. You're not quite sure what went wrong the first time and you can't, but you can still talk about how you set it up and what you think went wrong. And that could be part of your hypothesis. So, so I have seen that happen uh, and certainly it's, it's a, um, a possibility. Like I said, we had two students last summer who had, who literally had posters where there were blank spots, either because the the research results were such a mess or um, our poster session was a little bit earlier last year and some people's results weren't quite through yet so that was an interesting um, point for us to remember when we set the time this year but yeah so non-results are still results you may not be able to publish those in you know a journal like science or nature although sometimes you can but definitely here at the undergraduate research level, we do still recommend and support that non-results are still results. Tell us what you think went wrong and that still showcases your learning. The online writing center, just again, to put that out there, sometimes you can have a tutor or just some feedback and all of this is free to current University of Saskatchewan students. So do keep that in mind. We have some online resources at the library and of course everything's all online right now. So definitely check those out once you have your 300 words or even if you have a, built a poster and you want some feedback, the library will also give you feedback on that, on that. So definitely look to them if you don't have people in your lab or your research group that can help you out with that. Okay, so normally at this point, we talk about the mechanics of printing. This year, because we're going to be doing our symposium online, few of you are going to be actually physically printing your poster. However, I still want you to make sure that your poster is able and ready to print. The pandemic will not last forever, and you might want to have 
a physical copy of your of your poster and your supervisor might want to have a physical copy of your poster. So normally we need to make sure that students are planned ahead and are finished with lots of time to actually get their posters printed. It's still a good idea. So do keep this in mind. The sooner you're finished your poster, uh, the, the more that you can uh, spend time perfecting it. So definitely you want to get things down. Normally, students are responsible for printing costs. Of course, we're not going to be having that this year. What will happen is that we will have all of the students upload their posters into that Canvas shell. So we're going to be, we are going to be using the new learning management system of Canvas, and our conference will be part of the Canvas system. We will probably be using them as PDFs because they will be the smallest and you will need to save them as a PDF anyway for printing at a printing firm. So you'll be able to save your poster as a PDF. However, I will actually ask students, those that may not have um, anything on their poster that, that let's, let me back up. If your poster is able to be shared in public, I will ha I do have uh, social media vehicles where I'd like to be able to put some of those posters out on social media uh, through the undergraduate research portals. And so I will ask that students save their files both as a PDF and as either a JPEG or a TIFF file, simply because then we will have a visual that we can put out over the internet in a different way. So Twitter and Facebook, they can't accept PDFs, they need to have, and, and Instagram as well, of course, they need to have JPEGs or TIFFs. So we will try and have at least some of the posters that we can share uh, beyond the LMS Canvas. All right, the last thing that I wanted to talk about, and I'm, I have a session next week for those of you who've uh, had a chance to sign up, but we are going to ask that all of the, anyone who puts in a poster also will have to do a three minute video that explains their poster. And the reason why we do that is because we don't have that in-person face-to-face interaction this year. So we need to find a way around that, a way to replicate that. And so what we're going to do is that we're going to ask everyone to do a three to maybe five minute at the utmost, but aim for three minute video that accompanies your poster, that, that you act as a tour guide for your poster and tell us about your poster. What I want to do is talk about some of the overarching um, best practices around presenting with poise. Hopefully we'll be back to an in-person again, but this is what I want you to start with. Even if you're going to be doing a video, I want you, before you hit your camera button and start to record yourself, I want you to practice your power pose. Go into the bathroom, do it in your room before you start to record. But the power pose is the Wonder Woman pose. And you need to stand straight and tall, arms out. You can also stand in an X position with your arms out nice and tall. It gives your body confidence, strength, and energy. And all of that confidence, strength, and energy comes out in your voice. The taller you sit, and if you record your presentation standing up, even better. That gives your voice and your body the confidence, strength, and energy that you will then project throughout your, um, throughout your poster session. So definitely, if you're doing a live poster session, go and do this stretch first. I know it sounds funny. It really does, but it works. Every single interview I've ever done, I have done this. I go into the bathroom. I strike that power pose, the Wonder Woman pose, and then usually the X pose as well. Do some deep breathing, and it gives your body confidence, strength, and energy. We will need you to present an oral presentation to go along with your poster. I want you, when you're doing that oral presentation, to start with always introduce yourself. My name is Merle Massey, and today I'm going to talk about the purpose of your research. That is not the topic of your research. It's the purpose of your research. So that is to say, my name is Merle Massey. My research, my overarching research is interested in why we tell stories the way we do. Then I will launch into the presentation itself. Today I'm going to be talking about my poster. And this is what it's going to do. Then you build that three minute overview. Again, that three minute elevator speech. Normally when you're doing it live, 
you have the opportunity to invite questions and build a conversation. I do want you to write out that presentation and practice it beforehand before you record it. Couple of tips. When you give an oral presentation like this, it's not just a guide to your poster. It's also that you need to give both sides. A good researcher understands both the good things that you've done with your research and anything that you would do differently the next time. Or say, I think this way, or I've chosen to go, to go in this direction. Other researchers believe it should go in this direction. Always present both sides. It shows that you're aware of any kind of conversations, let's put it that way, within your discipline. The next thing you do, of course, is to say what you would do differently next time. So if you could go back and start your research again, what would you change? And also, and this is the most critical, what you'd like to research next. What, has, what avenues or areas of interest or new research questions did your research pop open for you? If you were to continue to your research, where would you go next with it? So that's, these are some of the key things that I'd like you guys to think about uh, when you're doing your presentation that goes along with your poster. Normally, in person, you would have eye contact. I would tell you guys, don't be on your phone. Always have your head up. Uh, give them a chance to read the poster. Of course, in, in our online format, some of this doesn't really work. However, we will still have a synchronous component, and I haven't quite determined exactly what it's going to look like, but we want to have a synchronous component where people will be able to text you or, or put, put on the canvas any of their live questions that you'll be able to answer live. So we may have a, a live uh, component. So some of this uh, might come up, but normally this, is, this particular slide is for what happens when you're doing a poster session live. Here's a couple of neat ideas. Again, most of these will only work in a live session, but some of them you might be able to apply. So here's a few neat ideas that can work. On the top left, that's a QR code. I would recommend for all of you to embed a QR code into your poster. Anyone who takes a look at your poster will be able to follow that link and, and see a little bit more of your background research. The other three are all things that I have seen done to good effect if you're having a live poster session. Handouts. So that, that funny looking puzzle piece, he's giving handouts to the people who come to his poster session. And uh, so I've seen that done to very good effect, a bit of a one page overview of a poster. Bottom left, I've seen people do some very good work around having a live computer screen there. In the symposium last summer, one of the two of the students actually developed a game and so they brought their computer, people could sit down and play the game for five or 10 minutes. So they had great interactivity. And on the bottom right, that is a picture of something 3D, something physical. So let's say that you study something that that you could actually bring with you and bring a model or bring uh, something from your from the lab or something perhaps a. a you were allowed to bring uh, an old um, um, piece of something that historical that you could physically have with you that people could then take a look at, touch, smell, see, feel, understand the 3D capability of it. And so sometimes a physical model works. Now, clearly, obviously, those bottom three or those three uh, won't work in, a, in a, uh, our presentation format this summer, but hopefully going forward next summer, we will have a live session again. There are multiple, would handouts be a good idea for supplementing material for your poster? Absolutely. Um, I have seen that done to very good effect, Jack, to have handouts created, especially if they take your poster uh, in a new direction. I don't recommend that you would hand it out to everyone, but those who actually took the time to stop and talk to you about your poster, those are the ones who would be interested in taking the supplementary, the supplementary material. Over and above our SURE summer, summer Symposium this year, there will be other ways to share your work. There will be the USCSU Symposium, which is usually in January. Many of you might be able to publish, rework your summer uh, work for the University of Saskatchewan Undergraduate Research Journal, USERGE. 
You could submit your poster as a research snapshot. That's a possibility or to rework the paper behind your poster and submit that. There are also, of course, disciplinary conferences. Most of your supervisors are probably looking uh, to you to think through how you would take your summer research and develop it into a journal article. And so disciplinary conferences, especially since your poster will already be created, uh, your poster will be able to be shown at other disciplinary conferences. And I would recommend and highly support you to put those posters forward to some of those disciplinary conferences in the year to come. I am at the end of what I'm here to talk about today. So are there further questions? Does anyone have anything that they would like to ask me in the chat? Just to give you an update, yes. So 24th to the 26th of August uh, will be the symposium, the poster symposium this year for the SURE program. So that is for any and all students who are undergraduate students at the University of Saskatchewan working on research projects this summer. Everyone is welcome to put in a poster. If you haven't already signed up, please do so. I'm going to be sending out supplementary information on next steps and planning within the next couple of weeks. I don't see any questions coming in. Amalia, thank you very much uh, for keeping an eye on that, making sure that I didn't miss anything that came in on the chat. I think uh, I caught everything as we were going along. And if not, uh, do send me an email. And thank you all very much for being here today. Hopefully this was helpful. So start writing, start your poster, edit, 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 ask other people to read it really good visuals, and the fewer words, the better. Keep it simple. Thank you. It was very helpful. I'm glad. I'm glad it was helpful, and we will see all of you next week. Some of you, I think, will be along next week when we talk about uh, the three minutes. So what I want you guys to put into your three-minute elevator pitch or your three-minute poster session. So join me next week for that session, and we'll see you then. Thanks. Bye. I'm stopping the